Hey, welcome back to the CRP. I am Miguel Dorati, and this is the Cage Rage Podcast number 87. And uh, we're going to go back to the tried and true subject of boxing history. And I'm going to try a little something different today, or maybe a little something more interesting, not totally different, because uh, we've looked back at Jack Johnson and the uh, era of 1910, and we've also used the Illustrated Record magazines in the past uh, to guide us for some of these podcasts, and that's what I'm going to do. So the subject here is going to be the build-up to the uh, Jack Johnson, Jim Jeffries fight of the century, and what we're talking about there is the July 4th, 1910 fight that went down in Reno. The promoter, obviously, Tex Rickard. 16,000 people attended that fight live. Now, in Reno, Nevada, 16,000 people in 1910. You had miners, and you had people who uh, traveled by train to see the fight. Uh, but, at the end of the day, you know, the, uh, the thing went down in the desert in Reno. It wasn't even Vegas at the time or anything like that, so... But you had Tex Ricker, the uh, promoter extraordinaire there and the, the uh, soon-to-be pervasive uh, promoter on the East Coast, but he was still cutting his teeth out West here. And, uh, you know, this is an example of... Uh, this fight bounced around. It was supposed to be held in San Francisco, and it was supposed to be held, uh, you know, in certain other spots that were looking to hold it. And, uh, you know, they always shut it down. And so Jack Johnson and Jim Jeffries went down in Reno... In an arena that uh, Tex Rickard had built. And, uh, you know, they had the specifications. They said, all right, we can fit, you know, the XX here. These tickets are this amount and this, that. And, uh, you know, he was pretty organized in setting up, you know, 16,000, you know, basically bleachers, I guess, uh, to see this fight. And, uh, you know, again, the Jack Johnson as the champion defending it against Jim Jeffries returning as an undefeated champion to, uh, you know, try to avenge the white race. That was... The, the whole thing behind this fight. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the May time frame in the Illustrated Record. I got uh, all the Illustrated Records from uh, May of 1910 through, you know, obviously well through July of 1910. So I'm going to look at about eight or ten issues of the buildup and to see how this magazine uh, treated Jack Johnson and uh, you know we'll look at the racist stuff from 1910 a lot of the times some of it is cold some of it's stuff you're gonna see uh, you know up front and very personal for the first time you know maybe maybe for the first time or if not it'll be a good reminder of just how ugly the racism was and uh, you know there's some ebbs and flows to it and stuff and I'm sure a real good study could be done but uh, this is going to be bringing it to light a little bit and uh, you know the end of the day here uh, if uh, the illustrated record or somebody gets mad at me for doing this, I'm doing it uh, for the greater good of boxing and race relations and things because uh, there's nothing like the truth and bringing the truth to light to really, uh, you know, make a subject gel and stuff. So we, we still need a lot of help when it comes to racism. I'm not claiming to be uh, any type of savior or anything like that, but I think that the, the more we look at it, the more uh, we can go ahead and say, hey, uh, you know, uh, hopefully it's something from our deep past, as, as it looks like here. So, the May 7th illustrated record on the cover has uh, uh, Sam Lanford and Stanley Ketchell fighting a fast draw, so obviously high-level stuff there. And uh, when you get over to the sporting word, it says, uh, Johnson says why he will beat Jeffries, is the headline, or the uh, second headline, then... Uh, thinks he could have whipped the big fellow in his prime. And uh, then here comes, it says, the Negro will soon begin active training. So on May 7th, he hadn't just uh, started official training yet. There's a reference to his 1907 knockout over Jim Flynn in a little picture there that has Flynn prone on the ground with Johnson over him. And uh, by picture, I mean a little, a little drawing. And uh, the, there's an interesting couple of paragraphs I'm actually going to read from this one because... Uh, it addresses the point uh, of racism uh, from the words of Jack Johnson himself, and I think that that makes it very interesting. What we have here is it says, Johnson says, the big fight is not between races. And I'm reading from about the middle of page 14 of the illustrated record from May 7th, 1910. Johnson says, the big fight is not between races. San Francisco, California. Jack Johnson doesn't approve of the coming world championship fight being labeled a clash of the races. 
He says it's nothing of the kind. It's not even an international episode. It is simply a tilt for the ribbon between a brace of American fighters. He says when it comes down to it, he can't prevent any colored men or group of colored men going into hysterics if he should happen to go down or down the king of the white-skinned fighters. Rejoicing of that description, however, will be merely a substratum in the layers of exultation that will pile up if Jack Johnson, heavyweight, defeats Jim Jeffries, the heavyweight. Johnson is long on horse sense, just at present, believes that the loudest pains of joy will emanate from those men who back the winner. These say Jack will have occasion to chortle, for they exercised their judgment and profited from the process. So, interestingly, back in 1910, and, you know, you already credit Jack Johnson as, as being, you know, a, a historic figure in terms of, of you know, uh, advancing the race and, uh, and the equality of the race here. He was the first black heavyweight world champion. And, uh, you know, he says this fight isn't about the races. They, you know, if you're betting money and you win, those are the guys that are going to be happy, whether you bet me or you bet him. And, you know, if you're white, you'd be even smart to bet me because I'm going to win. You know, I, that's the underlying current here. And he's trying to poo-poo a little bit of the white versus black, but that's going to be all over the place here. This magazine, the May 7th one, doesn't have a lot of it, uh, uh, of hype for that fight. Just a couple of paragraphs. Doesn't uh, display it on the cover or anything like that. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. A week later, we've got the uh, May 14th illustrated record. And this one does have... An interesting depiction of Johnson and Jeffries on the cover. And, uh, you know, this is 1910, so this one caught me by surprise. I was looking at this, and it has Jack Johnson and Jim Jeffries both dressed in drag. And I don't mean, you know, I mean the big hats and, uh, you know, the dresses with the long flowy things. And Uncle Sam is fitting them for a shoe, like I guess in the uh, Cinderella mode or... or uh, where the sh if the shoe fits and the shoe says championship on it so very interesting thing here uh the depiction there and the, them dressed as women i you know i almost don't know what to say it caught me like i said caught me by surprise because in 1910 uh you know i don't know this magazine is 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 it has a lot of boxing coverage and a lot of other stuff that's very interesting so uh kudos to these guys in 1910 dressing them up as as women I think it, it, it shows a little bit of an open mind. I don't know. Uh, at the bottom of the cover, it says, The great question, who will it fit? The next issue of the record will contain illustrations of Jack Johnson training. There will be a large demand for this number. Send in your orders early and make sure of getting the co number of copies you need. So they distributed this thing uh, by using agents. So, you know, I, I got 15 I could sell. Send me 15 and I'll get rid of them. You know, that kind of thing. 1910 was definitely... Um, a long, long, long time ago. So the call of the agents uh, goes on, and, and they also have, uh, on page seven, don't miss this offer, you know. Um, if you know a boy selling the record in your town, uh, that's great. If not, go ahead and send us a name, and uh, we'll see if we can get an agent over set up over there selling the record. So they look for somebody to send it to your town, and then that guy would be in charge of distributing it, and I imagine that, uh, you know, a lot went into that. They had to get the news back to wherever the Illustrated Records printing press was, I guess, and then from there distribute. So definitely uh, you can see why it was a weekly. Um, you know, there was a, uh, there's a coupon on page 15 that you can clip, and it says, Jeffries and Johnson in fighting pose. Uh, this coupon with uh, 15 cents in stamps is good at purchasing a fine picture of either Jeffries or Johnson Size of the picture is 18 by 22 printed on high grade paper and just a thing for framing. So they were uh, selling coupons and things for the fight already by May 14th. And the headline is basically uh, about training here. Jack Johnson now training systematically for his fight with Jeff. So on the 7th, he hadn't started training yet. Now by the 14th, he is training systematically for his fight with Jeffries. And one of the things I found very interesting is, is a section called Stories. Uh, from the camps and um, one of the things that comes up here is Farmer Burns being a member of Jack Johnson's camp and Farmer Burns is uh, an interesting character to me he's a guy that delved in boxing doesn't have anything uh, like a remarkable record there but what he also did was he did pro wrestling and at that time pro wrestling I think it was a very different animal and you had a, a, a real question there 
as to who was the tougher guy, the boxing world champion or the wrestling world champion, as, as this is the era of Carl Gotch and, and legendary wrestlers. Gotch also has some boxing matches and maybe even did more boxing matches under a different name and things like that. So, you know, you've got the Farmer Burns story here. And uh, let me find this exact set here. One of the Farmer Burns' favorite tricks is to place a derby hat across the chest let you pass the rope through around his body and the hat. Then removing the hat, he expands his muscles and chest until the slack in the cord is all taken up. Another of his diversions is to invite strong men to clutch him by the neck and try to strangle him. Once the muscles of that column and neck are set, he defies the efforts of most vigorous clutch and only invites you to choke harder. On a wager, this extraordinary athlete once permitted himself to be actually hanged by the neck just to show that his set muscles could resist even the handman's noose. He has a photograph to prove, and a most gruesome exhibit it is. Dick Adams waggishly says that Adams so, says he saw the photograph. He had always supposed Burns was born to be hanged because he is so abst ab abstemious. Though scorning all small vices, Burns is not at all averse to a wager. Indeed, in financial matters, Adams insists the old wrestler is a farmer in name only. He gave proof of his physical fitness one day when Mr. Hector McKenzie of San Francisco bought as a visitor to the camp the guest of Baron Henkel, a young and athletic officer in the army of the Kaiser, who prided himself that he was a rather accomplished wrestler. The young Baron talked so much of his prowess that finally someone suggested a wrestling match between him and Farmer Burns. The German was willing, but when they told him his antagonist was to be a man 50 years old, he demurred, saying he feared he might hurt the old chap. Don't worry about me, said Farmer. So they stripped and went at it after various bets had been made. Mr. McKenzie, with a wink, back the German visitor. Jeffries witnessed about and enjoyed it, though he declined to act as referee, appointing McKenzie to that post. The young Baron was game and powerful. He did not suspect he had been pitted against the former champion of the art, but when they came to grips in the, ring, in the roped ring of the training quarters, an inkling of some such fact must have quickly come to his mind. The tussle was short and decisive. One round was enough, the Baron said. Farmer Burns had the Teutons shoulders down on the mat in something less than two minutes. My word, but you're a very strong man, was the only comment the young officer made as he shook hands with the veteran old enough to be his father. The Baron is probably wondering yet whether most American farmers are like that at 50 years of age. So Farmer Burns stepping up, and uh, I, I, I obviously... A member of Jeffries' camp, rather, and uh, you know Jeffries there making bets and uh, having a physical fitness guy like that or a, a guy like that, a tough guy like that in camp, definitely means something, you know, in terms of what they were trying to do. I think uh, they were planning for infighting, and as the headline mentions, Jack Johnson systematically training. So you're in a situation there where you know we're already looking at boxing as a science, and they're breaking down things. And uh, Farmer Burns, a dirty old wrestler. You know, must have been uh, something that that uh, he could convey for the infighting that was going to occur there. So, as we continue on to the May 21st issue, the May 21st issue shows uh, promises on the cover illustration showing Jack Johnson's big uh, for the big fight. And uh, here you don't have any other picture on the cover, just that mention and. Uh, for the first time, you get a gatefold of uh, the centerfold where it's Jack Johnson uh, being shown here. And these pictures are all very fascinating. Some of them do. Uh, you know, uh, they may all really have, you know, uh, definite racist undertones, some worse than others. Uh, the centerpiece depicts Jack Johnson's head, and it's a head shot. I've got a little tear there in the book, but... Uh, you know, he's dressed in a suit and stuff like that, and I can't say, you know, the depiction's completely off or anything like that. Apparently, uh, he gets a rub down uh, before he does his workouts, and uh, you've got his white trainer there, uh, you know, giving him a massage in one of the drawings. Uh, he obviously liked to play baseball as part of his training, and they would uh, throw the ball and, and, and hit with the bat around, and obviously the body motion and stuff, help, I guess uh, they helped... Uh, you know, he felt helped him. You know, there's always the talk of the old boxers doing handball. Uh, you know, if you remember the old handball, the ball against the wall kind of thing. 
And, uh, you know, that is a lot of body motion and back and forth and stuff like that. You'd be surprised at how much of a workout that is. And Johnson, uh, obviously, choosing baseball. He also liked to swim. It shows Johnson in the water. It says Johnson likes the water. It shows him drawing a team of burrows here with, like, sunglasses on. I don't know exactly what they're getting at there, but it doesn't look like an appealing picture. And it says drawing his team of burrows. So I guess if he's got... But I, I'm not sure. I don't know why it's horses. Then they get, you know, here's one. Dance is an occasional jig, and it gives you a little bit of a picture. Now, this is really starting to get a, a, into the old type of depiction here because I, I don't think we could get away with a drawing like that nowadays, and I don't think we should, you know. But um, obviously they're, they're taking a dig there at, at Jack Johnson with the gig jig picture. This one I also don't like. I, or I guess I don't understand the full context because he's on a 12-mile run and he's got a cat marching next to him and uh, he's in, you know, he's in, he's carrying a walking stick and he's in pants, a suit, and suspenders, a hat, and shoes, quite clearly shoes, not, not anything to run in. So I'm not quite sure, you know, if, if they're saying he's taking it easy on his runs or what that is. But again, again I think that there was some definite... You know, Johnson, with his money and achievements in boxing, did like a lifestyle where he was well-dressed and things like that. And I'm wondering if they're taking a shot at him there, you know, that he ran that way and things like that. There's also a couple of hardcore pictures of him practicing rough tactics and infighting. Uh, and Johnson also uh, working on his muscle training by digging ditches. Um it's so it shows him sparring with George Cotton as well. So this is the centerfold, and that's I guess you know in the days when they couldn't put pictures in the magazines yet, the illustrations showing Jack Johnson training in a the fight. These are drawn pictures, and some of them, uh, like I said, the drawing is quite nice, but you know it's definitely of the era and something that you you, you do want to take a look at. At this point. The news is that uh, the Emeryville, California racetrack is going to be hosting the fight. And uh, uh, so it would be moved from the, uh, the day that they were expecting it to be here. And again, Johnson's giving uh, outlines of his battle plan here. He wants to wear uh, Jeffries out. Jeffries, uh, there's a headline that says Jeffries' wind is perfect. And there's a lot of that that will be in the coverage of the conditioning of the guys. And there's, you know, that's highly what... The coverage is including visits later and things like that. And uh, then there's a column that says the big prize fight, a live topic. Uh, so a lot of people are obviously talking about the prize fight and things like that. And um, if I'm looking here, very interesting. Another time, uh, wrestling guy, another all-time wrestler, uh, making a quote about the Jim Jeffries and um, uh, Jack Johnson fight. So this is interesting because... You know, nowadays, pro wrestling and boxing, you know, there's just nothing to it. I know pro wrestling did like a little boxing tournament like 15 years ago that uh, Bart Gunn won or something like that. And, you know, maybe on occasion you had Floyd Mayweather make an appearance in the boxing, uh, in the WWE ring and stuff like that. But not like in the old days where they trained together and things like that. Here you got the all-time great Frank Gotch talks on alleged poor condition of Jeffries. Frank Gotch, the world champion wrestler who was scheduled to go to the coast soon to help get Jeffries into Schaefer's battle with Jack Johnson at Emeryville on Independence Day, declares that the Californian is in good physical condition despite recent reports to the contrary. Gotch toured the, uh, Gotch toured the country with Jeffries and his troop of athletes and declared he is in a position to speak positively of Jeffries' condition. Gotch will not go to the coast until after his championship match with Zabisco, the Polish aspirant, which is scheduled to be contested at Chicago on May 30th. The following is what Gotch has to say about Jeffries. We've been hearing a great deal of rec uh, recently about Jeffries' poor condition. Simply because he has been suffering from boils, the cry has gone out that he cannot stand training, that he is, an, uh, that he is all in and that his vitality is so low that he never will be able to get into shape to meet Johnson. All this talk is certainly premature. Bells are no fatal, uh, sorry, boils are no fatal affliction for athletes, nor are they uncommon. Every wrestler suffers from them from time to time, and how often do you hear of half of the members of a big football team having the carbuncles? The fact is that Jeffries enforced the layout from training owing to his slight affliction. The fact is that Jeffries was forced to lay off from training owing to his slight affliction, in my mind, is a good thing for him, 
as he is tearing away at the work at a tremendous clip, going perhaps a little too fast a furry fellow two months before the fight. So Carl Gotch checking in for a second time. The wrestlers, uh, you know, making known their opinions on the upcoming world championship fight. So very interesting here. We move on to the May 28th issue. And uh, this one, once again, has related details on the cover. May 28th issue shows Jack Johnson... And uh, it says, Jack Johnson takes on two men, San Francisco. The colored champion, again, there's that, you know, why not just the champion? They have to say the colored champion, right? It's just, it, it, wasn't he just the champion? I think he was, right? So, anyway, the colored champion demonstrates his skill as a scrapper by outfighting two of his sparring partners, one of whom he sends to the floor. And there's a picture there of him rocking one guy, and he's actually sparring with a black fighter and a white fighter, um... So that to me, you know, also it may be notable. The gatefold in this this issue rather is dedicated to uh, the fights that went on there. And then once we get back into the latter pages at the sporting record column, we got more headlines on the big fight as we close out the May issue. And here we got um, Jack Johnson will fight at 208 pounds. So they're already aiming for, you know, what they're going to look like in a, in, in, in a six-week period again here. Negro fighter has already been taken off nine pounds. And uh, next headline, Jeffries is gaining speed rapidly. Uh, Jim Corbett starts for fighting. Corbett would be part of Jeffries gaining, uh, you know, speed in his camp and stuff like that. Our second headline, Jeffries gaining speed. Uh, attacks on Jeff and the reasons. It's very unfortunate for Jim Jeffries that he is training for a prize fight instead of political office. The prospects seem bright for his being the worst roasted man who ever trained for a championship battle. Several of the Coke's papers have attacked him bitterly. He has been charged with everything from framing the 4th of July fight to being in a panic from fear. It has been reported that he refuses to train and that he is buried in perpetual sulks. In and about the town of Ben Lomond, where Rowardinian is located, Jeff is about as popular as the tax collector. Village joy riders who have saved up to keep the town automobile out until near midnight, go by his bungalow and boo at him. So, Jeffrey's maybe not popular there, and uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know what that means. Uh, you know, I guess all camps go through that, and uh, but perhaps it's also a, a reaction of the white race there, kind of preparing for, you know, the inevitability of Johnson winning. Now, don't get me wrong. I really think you know white people wanted Jeffries to win. In a bad way. I mean, everything here hints at, you know, the the, the white race having to be duplicated. And not, we're not even getting into the Jack London stuff and, you know, real racist stuff that may have been going on around there. I'm just looking at one magazine and one record. And, uh, you know, I think that it, it shows there plenty. Um, uh, you know, so, yeah, you've got... Uh, People may be starting to make excuses for Jefferson. Like I said, uh, uh, you know, on the same page, because they're a newspaper-sized document, right? But on the same page, you've got them actually, you know, two headlines, Jeffrey's gaining speed, Jeffrey's, you know, gaining speed. It's like, it really did seem like, you know, or does seem like in retrospect, like a little bit of them trying to convince them. And Johnson does seem, you know, go back to the first issue we covered, Johnson, when he says, hey, this isn't about race, he seems like a real cool character from the very beginning, you know, like, he was up to the moment here, you know, and uh, definitely I find I find that in all the interactions def interesting. Moving on to the June fourth issue of the Illustrated Record, and I'm talking about June fourth, nineteen ten. Uh, once again, the cover uh, is Stanley Ketchell, so Ketchell active as heck in this time period here. Uh, by September, he'd be dead. So, um, uh, but on the top. You know, the front page illustration showing how Jack Johnson will fight Jeffries. So what we've got there is we've got, once again, um, the uh, the gatefold showing Johnson's tactics here. And again, now this, uh, we can take you through it here with a grain of salt on some of the art and things. Illustrating, illustration showing Johnson's punches and the tactics he will pursue when he meets Jeff. Uh, in the corner, Johnson sets himself for an attack. Johnson's trick of stabbing with the left and getting away. The Negro's left club-like blow to the wind uh, takes the wind out of them. 
there's a picture of Johnson up close with his opponent. It says Johnson likes to kid his antagonists. Uh, the main picture, the Negro's most famous punch is a right uppercut inside a man's guard. They can't stand many of those. By sliding back his long legs, the champion gets away from most swings. And Jack Johnson sometimes makes a wild swing to feel his man out. So, you know, uh, it talks about basic strategies and things like that. And obviously somebody's sitting around this camp and, you know, he's doing his training things. And this guy is actually probably just uh, at least uh, doing sketches of the drawings that he's going to put in the newspaper, right? Because that's what this is. Each one of those is, is a drawing, and they're quite, you know, you know, they're striking drawings, you know. I don't know that they're displayable, you know, because there is a racist aspect to it that is kind of also uh, negative and stuff like that. But I don't think that these should not be seen. I think, you know, white people, black people, I think everybody should see this stuff and see it for what it is, you know. that I'm glad the times have changed because some of this stuff is just really, it's, it's not right, you know. It's, and the way, you know, I'm not sure I, I have... You know, I, I never claim to have all the insight or anything like that, you know. But it, it kind of, you know, they didn't like that Jack Johnson had money and that he was bombastic and things like that. So, hey, they threw in the, the N-word every once in a while just to knock him down a little bit. And they had Jeffries as the great white hope, and obviously every white person wanted him to win. But then it also did look like there were some of them that said, you know, I don't think he's going to beat this guy. Or, you know, at least... Uh, you know, unconsciously, the psychology of some of this stuff looked that way, you know? Anyway, uh, continuing here with the June 4th issue. And uh, in the June 4th issue, what we got is the sporting record column on page 14. Jeff and Johnson both confident of winning the big fight. Jim and Jack are rapidly getting into shape for the championship battle July 4th. Once again, the theme of shape. John L. Sullivan talks about the oncoming contest. So now here we got... I mean, is John L. Sutherland royalty already in 1910? And, you know, the answer to that is absolutely. Uh, John L., the uh, first uh, glove champion, was a bare-knuckle champion back in his day. Here he was an older man, and he checks in with the following. John L. Sullivan discusses big fight. John L. Sullivan, with his bride, arrived in New York Saturday on the country linear Mauritania. Not since James J. Corbett won... From Sullivan and the heavyweight title at New Orleans, September 7, 1892, has the big fellow looked as well as he does at present. He has a healthy, ruddy appearance. His eyes are clear and bright. His gait firm and steady. A successful theatrical trip covering three months in England, Ireland, Scotland, with his old opponent, Jack Kilrain, as a sparring partner, puts Sullivan in a cheerful mood. And his reception at the dock reminded many who were on hand of the homage and affectionate regard formerly showered on formerly showered on Sullivan. While John L. was willing to discuss the coming fight, he was full of enthusiasm over his successful trip, which, which was, however, marred by the death of King Edward VII. The late ruler of the British Empire was a great admirer of Sullivan when the latter was in England 22 years ago, and John L. referred to the occasion when he boxed before the late king, who was then Prince of Wales. Sullivan said the world at large lost its true sportsman and the first gentleman and the British nation a great monarch. Sullivan talked entertainingly about Jeffries and Johnson, the two men. He said that he was anxious to reach the coast so that he could judge for himself the actual condition of the fighters and tell the truth. So Jeffries, uh, you know, in 1910, they already recognized the boxing world champion. And, uh, you know, you have Jack, uh, John L. rather, talking about the Jeffries and Johnson fight here. And John L. Sullivan, boxing royalty already, the first athlete to ever make a million dollars from athletics. And he did it exactly what he was doing here, which was vaudeville tours. It wasn't so much the paydays for the fights, but he would hit every town. And that whole story of shook the hand that shook the hand of John L., it's because the guy visited every place and sat for a week in the theater. If you had a theater, he sat there for a week with, in this case, it was Jack Kilrain. Before that, he would bring sparring partners and do his show and things like that. You know, knock out anyone in the audience kind of stuff, and uh, he made a million dollars, and that's John L. Sullivan, the first millionaire athlete, traveling by boat uh, back and forth to England, doing tours well into, you know, his older age here, and coming back to give, you know, to be mobbed and get his opinion on 
uh, the big fight coming up. So definitely, definitely to me, uh, the quotes and stuff in the illustrated record very interesting. By the time we get to the June 11th uh, sporting record, we've got Don't Miss the Jeffries Johnson cartoon in this number. And uh, it's a striking centerpiece, centerfold. And I can picture, you know, people hanging this up on their wall. At least kids, you know. I mean, you don't have much else and stuff. But watch the gathering storm. What will happen when these clouds come together July 4th? And it's a series of people, you know, very much of the times you got cops and uh, newspapermen and uh, Mounties and miners and vagabonds and boxers and sailors and, uh, you know, uh, there's blacks and whites and things all looking up at the sky and the sky has Jim Jeffries in one cloud and Jack Johnson in the other and they're heading toward each other. So, yeah, this looks to be like a, a collector thing from from there. You know, I bet there's not many of these left that are original that are in great shape. I have a copy and uh, mine's a little bit dinged up, but you can still get definitely a striking position. And at this point, uh, the fight's still scheduled for California because uh, California's made reference to in the... Uh, um, in the clouds and stuff. So, and then by the time you get back to the sporting record at this point, the column on page 14 has uh, basically only uh, um, news about uh, you know the uh, uh, the fight now. And Johnson bounces little after quarrel. So now look at this here. Jack Johnson exercised his executive power at his training camp Sunday afternoon by officially lopping off the managerial head of George Little, the black champion. Bade Little be gone and warned him never to show up at the place again, but Little refused to be discharged. Little claimed to have an ironclad contract. The word ironclad pops up a few times and stuff like that. So who knows what went on there, but definitely something, you know, the champion having to deal with a little, a little bit of pressure there during the fight. Um, John, Johnson makes speech after his exhibition. Jeffrey's in splendid shape. Once again, that theme of trying to, almost trying to convince the people. Corbett will well pleased with Jeff's condition. Another headline here on page 14. Both fighters deny fight to be a frame up. Grant permit uh, for big fight. So San Francisco at this point is granted the supervisor permit for the fight. And they think they're hosting it. Experts find condition of Jeff perfect. So this is, they've escalated. Now there's at least three mentions of Jeffries in his improving condition. Uh, in the June 11th columns and stuff like that. So, um, fascinating stuff. And again, Johnson in a little bit of controversy, uh, firing a manager in the middle of his training camp. And, and, you know, that type of thing still goes on today, right? So, it's just, it, it, to me, you know, the use of the words, the N-words, and, and the racism, and, and, and the depiction of Johnson, the overall way they uh, kind of look down on him, uh, at the t you know backhanded compliments and things like that, you know it's all very very you know offensive and very different than what you know we're used to now. Even though obviously you know we still deal with racism, but what I find interesting is too the stories that are very much the same. You know Jack Johnson loved cars. You know in the seventies Salvador Sanchez died, you know racing cars and things like that. So you know there are themes. These guys are Type A personalities. Uh, when they come into the public limelight, um, who knows how that gels. So now June 18th. Now, by June 18th, we're a couple of weeks away from the fight. And uh, once again, in this number, pictures showing Jeffries and Johnson preparing for the fight. They didn't get a cover shot or anything like that, but uh, they did get that mesh on the cover. And now once we get into the Illustrated Records gatefold again, here we have pictures with the big fellows in their training camps. Jeff beats Corbett in handball. There's handball again uh, being used as a, uh, um, a workout tool by the boxers. Again, a lot of body motion. Uh, and I could definitely see that. Uh, you know, if you play handball, go play handball the way they used to play handball. And you'll get a good idea that it's uh, definitely a, uh, a strong uh, workout. Jeff puts it on, Gentleman Jim, in a fast bout. So Jim Corbett also retired and stuff, but he's... You know, the man kind of coming in here to give uh, Jeff rounds and stuff. And, you know, the fact is he's beating him in, in, in a fast bout. He's beating him in handball. So, uh, again, it seems like the, the uh, hype 
uh, machine is out trying to convince people of Jeffrey's uh, uh, abilities here. Jeff fights a pulling machine. He's got some, uh, you know, weight equipment there. Jeff has a block for Johnson's uppercut, so he's working on specific techniques. Uh, Jim staggers Armstrong as he's got a variety of sparring partners. And uh, as we continue on to the Johnson side, Jim Johnson is showing shadow boxing with weights in his hands. The Negro has an inside counter for Jeff's left. Jack tells Kaufman to go at him. So again, Johnson uh, talking in his uh, fighting. The champion easily evades Al's rushes as he's uh, using Al Kaufman in his training class. Al Kaufman would, uh, training camp rather, Al Kaufman would later on come up as a potential opponent for him. And uh, Billy Delaney gives Johnson a few tips. And Johnson outruns his trainers. So uh, that's your centerfold there. Definitely some good pictures. Again, a, an artist probably at the camps drawing sketches, and that's what we're looking at here. And then, the, and uh, as we're here at the June 18th issue, we're going to go to the page 14 for the sporting record. Jeffries and Johnson, guess what? In splendid shape for the big fight. Both fighters show great speed in boxing bouts. The fight arena will soon be finished. So by now, they know they're going to Reno, and they're building the arena, and Tex Rickard said, you know what? We're not going to do it in Frisco. We're going to do it in... We'll do it in my place. I'll build it. Jeff and Corbett box three rounds. Johnson in the ring with Al Kaufman. The arena again soon to be completed. Jeffries has a block. Johnson in an auto beats the racehorse. So Johnson's still doing some, you know, shenanigans. He loved his cars. We know that. And here he used the car to, and he was racing a horse. So uh, uh, also there's a blurb that says Tom Flanagan is Johnson's manager as he had fired... Uh, a character named Little in the last issue. So things still going on uh, in the boxing world. But uh, that's what we had there for the big fight. So now what's coming up here? June 25th. It is really getting close now. And, you know, where can we go here? June 25th, the cover. Again, at the top, don't miss the Jeffries Johnson cartoon in this issue. The cover... I can, I can see what they're doing here. Teddy home again. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt, former president, had been off uh, in Africa at this point, I believe. He would meet Tex Rickard on one of these tours in South America in the jungle of um, Uruguay and, and Brazil and stuff. And Tex Rickard and Ted, Teddy Roosevelt shared time down there in, uh, in that. But that wasn't this trip. Teddy returning from Africa. And that was the big news. Now, to me, the gatefold here, this is fascinating. Now, we're less than two weeks from the fight. And what you have here is how will trouble end? And you have Jack, Jack Johnson looking over the shoulder of Jim Jeffries, and Jeffries has gone to see a, a person, a palmist called Madame Fistiana, and she's reading his palm, past and future read, while you wait, it says. She's looking at cards, and she is telling Jeffries, you're going to have trouble with a dark man. So the paper, less than two weeks before the fight, dedicating a centerfold to, hey, Johnson is going to give Jeffries a lot of problems. Moving on to channel, uh, page 14, rather. And moving on to page 14, and um, you've got Jeffries Johnson fight to be held in Reno. California governor would not allow the battle to take place in San Francisco. Fighters will meet July 4th as originally planned. So that all shook itself out. Billy Delaney takes charge of Johnson's camp. Jeff's test hard, says Mike Murphy. Reno getting ready for the big battle. Soldiers were ready to charge into the prize ring at the Langford Kaufman fight. So there's some stuff going on in the other part of the boxing world too. Jeffrey Johnson fight. Issue 842 is the one that's going to contain the reports and stuff. And uh, they're already advertising here on age 15, uh, page 15. So uh, interesting stuff there. Now, the July 2nd issue. You might get this on the day of the fight. And uh, this one dedicates the cover to it. It has a, a poor old dog with a dynamite strapped to his tail. The dog has a bone in his mouth that says championship. And the dynamite says Jeffries and Johnson on it. So they were expecting... Uh, the fight, the, the wrist holding the dynamite or lighting the dynamite says Rickard. So they're showing Tex Rickard there as a little bit of a antagonist and, and uh, a guy who was uh, 
maybe moving the racial cauldron. I don't think Rickard, yeah, you know, Rickard didn't publicly do that, I don't think. I think he was very much a silent guy. It's hard to see what he actually thought besides making money. I think he would have made any fight possible. In this case, he did do the white versus black fight. Um, and, uh, you know, for the, he's accused during the Jack uh, uh, Dempsey era as, as preventing black opponents from fighting Dempsey. So, you know, a lot going on here. But by this time in 1910, Rickard operating out west uh, definitely working uh, mixed fights here. He'd be the referee for this fight, as a matter of fact, because they uh, actually invited Teddy Roosevelt to be the ref, and uh, they sent cables and things, and uh, Teddy declined. So Tex Rickard actually made his one and only appearance as a referee uh, for this all-time historic bout, and that's uh, the Jeffries and Johnson bout. Now, the gatefold of this is just that. This is what the ring is going to look like. as Rickard in the corner. And Rickard in the middle of the two fighters, the two fighters posing off in the ring, and then you know a, a vast ring in public. Uh, you can see the camera operators in the in the photo and stuff like that. That's the gay fold, and this is to get your appetite wet for the last little bit of um, you know hype. This is the last hype before the big fight, basically. So. Uh, as we go on to the sporting record column, everything ready for the big fight July 4th. Jeffries and Johnson are in splendid shape and both confident of winning. Nevada governor says he'll make no attempt to stop the fight. That's good news. Johnson, sure he'll win. Reno, a busy place. So how, how the fighters compare. I like this. They gave you, a, 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 you know, two days before the fight. So you'll get this maybe the day of the fight, maybe a couple days after. And it gives you... A tail of the tape, basically, you know, everything from weight, the wrist, the forearm, bicep, ankle, calf, thigh, waist, reach, chest, expanded and normal, neck, height, age, etc., etc. So, just good stuff. And then uh, their history is looking good. Jim Jeffries looks good again. Another, you know, headline uh, of the thing here. So, definitely one of those things where. Um, yeah, they're ratcheting up the, the, the talk here. Now, obviously, there was a little bit of a quarrel. The back cover dedicates of interesting to fight fans, and you've got here a little bit of a quarrel between Jim Corbett and John L. Sullivan as Corbett prevented Sullivan from uh, having access to the camp, and there's an interesting photo of that here on the back. So definitely some interesting stuff. Now, once we get to the next episode... Their report, or the next issue, I keep saying episode, but the next issue, uh, this is the issue where Johnson has won. And I think, you know, for what I could have expected, the cover of itself is kind of, um, I don't want to use the word classy, but it's kind of respectful. The, the top, the first words you read are Johnson whips Jeffries, which is an accurate statement and doesn't bear any overtones over it. The photo is Johnson with Johnson's big smile. And you, you, he had the reputation of having that electric smile, that winning smile and stuff, and it's him. And it's basically what would be a headshot and his big smile. Jack Johnson, the conqueror of Jeffries. So um, they kept it kosher there. The centerfold, the finish of Jeffries in the 15th. That's all it says. It's got Rickard stepping in between Johnson and Jeffries, who's, Jeffries lie, is lying on the floor. And again, uh, this is a drawing and an illustration, but definitely a nice picture there in the gay fold. Now, once we get into the sporting record, the sporting record goes back through this, and it's just now back to reporting regular boxing news. What you have to do is you have to go to page two for the full coverage of the Jack Johnson fight with Jim Jeffries on the sporting record, and this is the sporting record of July 9th was when they pop, pumped this out. Big championship battle is stopped when the white man is practically knocked out. Johnson, easily the master, shows greater stamina, superior science, and better ring generalship. You know, I can't help but think 1910, that word master kind of has that master-slave connotation to it, and he, Johnson, easily the master. Why, you know, Johnson, easily the better fighter. You know, why do you have to use that word? Uh, and again, the white man is pra practically knocked out. It's like, man, you, you got killed. You know, but why put the word practically in a headline, you know? Uh, we've got word of their purses. They each made about $2,600 for the fight. 
at the end of the day um, Johnson cleared about 145,000 for the fight and Jeffries looked like he got 192,000 so Jeffries actually getting more of the pay and that's you know obviously the other guy was champion on top of everything else so you know you get to see a little bit of the inequality there now here they've got the main centerfold picture but they are promising pictures for the next issue will contain a pictorial review of the Johnson Jeffries fight to make sure of getting all the copies you need right now uh, to give them credit here this this newspaper dedicated two full pages pages two and three to descriptions of the fight including a round by round like I said they covered the purses and things and as far as in general the racism is there with the use of the words master and white man and things like that but because there are no pictures uh, yet it's in the next magazine that things are going to get hairy and that's where I'm going to go to next is the July 16th and uh, we're going to close with the July 16th issue we've been going here for about 45 minutes on one of my favorite subjects which is boxing history and uh, how racism played its role there and what we have here is this is the most frightening and ugly depiction now you've got Johnson as the champion they kind of gave him a little bit of do by not putting this on the cover right away but if you look at the July 16th depiction of Jack Johnson, it shows Jack Johnson sitting on a fence barefoot. There's a watermelon field in front of him, and each watermelon has the name of a, a potential contender, Langford, Kaufman, Burns. Behind him is a watermelon rind eaten with the name Jeffrey. So here's, you know, for no reason, the, wa you know, the watermelon... Uh, stereotype goes back to 1910 and Johnson making his pick for his next uh, you know uh, opponent the pictures of the fight as they were promised appear in the game fold and they're quite copious and nice and they're, they're the drawings there uh, it's simple Johnson plants the left to Jeff's eye in the first round Jeff hooks right to the jaw as well in round one Jeff falls short with a left in round two Jeff darks through the uh, big swings and Jeff puts a right under the heart. So Jeff Ruiz was landing a little bit. Jeff puts a stiff left in the mouth, draws some blood. Johnson hooks left to the mouth. Jim rushes and tries to end the fight. Jack puts a hot one on Jeff's nose. Johnson stops a vicious swing for the jaw. Come right into me, Mr. Jeffries. And Johnson was doing some talking there. Round eight, Jack was strong as Jeff is was in the clinches, so he's starting to show his strength. Round nine, Jeff drives terrific right into the ribs. Jeff tries to shove Johnson around. Johnson hammers Jeff's face. Jeff blocks Johnson's swing. Johnson closes Jeff's eye. Jeff puts it right to the ribs. Round 15, Jeff's helpless on the ropes and the finishing punch putting Jeff out. So a lot of little drawings. A lot of interesting art, and again, it seems to me like for a fight that Jeffries lost, that there's showed a lot of Jeffries landing punches there. You know what I mean? And uh, I guess you could expect that. Um, and as I stated, once you get there to the end, uh, you know the sporting record uh, by then. The headlines there: uh, Jack uh, Johnson and Langford may be matched. Both colored fighters say they're willing to fight, and the match could come in the near future. Gotch after Johnson. Corbett will train the wrestler to fight the colored man. So Carl Gotch, obviously, you know, seizing on the whole racism thing, wanted to go ahead and, uh, you know, be the guy to take on Johnson and stuff like that. So, you know, very interesting depictions here. Like I said, this is just one magazine that I have access to. And, you know, getting to look at 10 of them, like we've just done, or a little bit more, you know, you get to see the week to week, and, and you can see people, you know, maybe waiting to get the newspaper, waiting to read about, you know, what's going on, or they said Johnson's training and stuff like that. And this is, you know, this is what the people got. They got this delivered, and this is how they had the fight build up, you know, um, through the newspapers. You know, the daily newspapers may have had details on it, and then here, you know, you get this, which is would be, you know, a weekly with news. And has drawings and things like that. And has a different take on things. So very interesting to cover the news. Very interesting to look at it and see the racism of 1910. As bold as it was, that last cover uh, to me of the uh, July 16th issue is, is, is striking. Um, you know, the, the, that's pervasive through the, that era of the coverage. So 
uh, we might as well accept the fact that uh, when we talk about Jack Johnson fighting under pressure, uh, you know, look no further than just the way that he was depicted in, in media coverage. Uh, uh, it was like a backhanded flattery when it was nice, and then other chances, every chance they got, they, they'd bring up stereotypes and things like that. So uh, it's definitely been a fun podcast. This has been CRP number 87, looking at boxing history and the uh, Jack Johnson, Jim Jeffries fight from 1910, July 4th, 1910, and the buildup to it. We reviewed 10 or 12 of the illustrated record in Old Time Magazine that uh, was coming out on a weekly basis, delivering coverage to the people of that era just to see what it was that they were getting. Uh, please hit like and subscribe if uh, uh, you uh, enjoyed the podcast and uh, check out some of our older podcasts. We're not afraid to look at racism here as it pertains to boxing and things like that because, you know, as it is a part of American history, it is a part of boxing history and, and uh, perhaps continues to be so to this day. So uh, we're bringing things to light, trying to contribute to the greater good and the greater good of boxing. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Miguel Adorati for the CRP.